welcome everybody to the Revelation series, part 21. And if you go on my website, I don't have the link here because we had some technical difficulties, but the link will show up to the notes on, uh, on the description of the edited video because um, I've changed, I have a separate page now just for Revelation series because I have another separate page for my journey through the Bible notes and they would have all just been jumbled on that homepage. So, part 21, we're going to look at the end of Revelation chapter 6 and then next week we're going to do a recap of the whole chapter. This chapter is crucial because it really is the six seals sets the stage of, of the tribulation. It's kind of the whole tribulation, and then on the, on the seventh seal, that unlocks the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath, and then we're laid, the rest of Revelation, all of those events fit within the timeline of these six and then seventh seal, which we'll see in two chapters. So this sixth chapter opens, Jesus opens the six seals, um, and so let's pray. Lord, as usual, we need your Holy Spirit to catch in our spirits what our brains can't handle. So, Lord, teach us. Teach me in the midst of this. And if there's anything further to our study earlier that would be in my notes that you want to express, then, God, I'm your servant. Just go ahead and, and speak, and I'll do my best to listen and to articulate what I hear. So... Um, in these crazy, crazy days where um, we may be in the end times, we'll know in hindsight, regardless, we want to understand your heart for the end of this story. So re reveal it to, it to us tonight. Give us a revelation tonight, Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, a recap. Jesus opened six of the seven seals in this chapter. Each seal unlocks a judgment upon the earth. And what, he, what each judgment, the purpose of the judgment is to force people to a decision. And we're going to see that some people decide in this text, uh, but at the end of chapter 6, they make their decision. But it's weeding out the unbelievers and the lukewarm Christians. So, the first four seals, four horsemen come out. The first one, seal number one, uh, the white horse is false Christs. It's a white horse. It's a rider on a white horse. It's simulating Jesus, but it is not Jesus. We see that in the, in the de detail in the teaching. He's bent on conquest, and that's not the heart of, of our Jesus. So the first seal will be, will do people recognize the real Jesus? Seal number two is about wars. It's a test about wars. Do wars alarm you, or do you know who is in control? Look at the effort that, that uh, Jesus took before he got to this sixth chapter and, and revealing the end time events by popping these seals off the scroll, telling the story. He, he tells us that he's in control. First chapter, when he introduces himself, he talks lovingly yet firmly to the, to the seven churches for the next two chapters. Then the next two chapters again, verse four and five, he, we go to mission control, the throne room of heaven, so that there's no mistake by the time we get here that we know who is in control. Yet that second test is wars. If you're listening to the news, there's wars all over and rumors of wars all over. Do wars alarm you or do you know who is in control? Then the third seal, the famine. Who is your supply? The, the earth was never meant to hold 8 billion people and climbing, even in a pandemic, believe it or not. Look at this, look at the numbers. Uh, we're still overpopulating the earth. The population is not going down. There were eight, uh, 6,000 deaths through COVID alone in Ontario, which is tragic. But there were 145,000 births in Ontario in the year 2020. So we're, st we're still overpopulating the earth. That is going to uh, hinder our supply uh, when we all come out of this pandemic and each country needs to deal with its debt. We're going to see uh, supply and demand just go crazy. So what is the third The third test is in, in the midst of famine and price gouging and all that shit, who's your supply? That's the third test of end times. The fourth test is, is death. Death riding on, on that pale horse with Hades, 
the place of death, right behind. How do you handle death? Is the earth your home or is heaven your home? And the New Testament makes it clear, doesn't it? The, the guys in the book of Acts, the believers, th there's nothing about romances, about child rearing. You know, this, I mean, there's little, little things because it's the word of God, it's the instruction book. But it's these guys that are out of the gate telling people about Jesus because they felt the time was short. So anyway, those are the false Christ, wars, famine, and death. How we handle all those things. These horsemen, it also occurred to me when I was putting this together, that they're called out by the four living creatures who represent collective humanity. Remember that in the, in the fourth chapter? And they unleash these four horsemen, which is human chaos. I find that very interesting. And the horsemen set the stage for someone to come and rescue the earth. So I believe these first four horsemen is the first three and a half years of the tribulation where we're going to see when we get to chapter 13, and we looked at the timeline last, last week, how we get the seven years of tribulation, that the Antichrist comes and has three and a half years at the end of the tribulation to, in the name of rescuing the earth, also says, I'm God, worship me. There's a false resurrection, and, and, or, or fake resurrection. He fakes the resurrection and death and resurrection. It's kind of funny. Anyway, um, so... I believe the four horsemen set the stage for the Antichrist to rise to power because the earth is going to be absolutely devastated by humans. Uh, so then we looked at seal number five, the souls crying out to God from under the altar. We saw them, we looked at them showing up again in chapter seven. These are post-rapture converts. So the rapture is when Jesus comes back in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are left, us, will rise to meet him in the clouds. That is either the beginning or most likely mid-tribulation. Okay, And just, just a note, Dave and I were sitting here talking, the whole mark of the beast and, and the killing of Christians is the last half of the tribulation. So if you have any fear over those things, go up in the rapture. Get close to Jesus, be raptured, and you will not have to deal with those things. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Um, so anyway, these post-rapture converts are killed during the tribulation because they will not deny that Jesus is, is Lord and then worship, worship the Antichrist. They say no to that because they've experienced the rapture and now they're fully convinced, finally, not just convinced, but their lifestyle is now fully uh, fully embracing and moving forward to being a Christian, which still means a follower of Jesus, by the way. Not somebody who goes to church, but a follower of Jesus. They're given white robes and told to wait until the full number of martyrs has come, which would be to the end of the tribulation. And there's lots of them. They're called in chapter 7, the great multitude. There's going to be a huge revival, great multitude of post-rapture converts that no one can count. A great multitude. Wow. Then we get to, tonight, seal number six. This is Armageddon and the commencement of the second coming, which um, <laughs> is devastating. We'll get to that. Since everyone is hiding from the wrath of the Lamb, it seems that the Lamb has responded <laughs> to their threat. That's all in the text. Let's read it. So this is Revelation chapter 6, starting at verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. Who can withstand it? Hmm. <laughs> Who can withstand it? Okay, you ready for this? 
So first of all, there's a perspective change, which I like to note these things. John was really catching this revelation firsthand. So the lamb opens the sixth seal in his hands, and then John notices below, so he's in the throne room of heaven, John's in the throne room of heaven, and he notices below an earthquake. Remember Revelation 5, the cavern between heaven and earth opened up, and you could hear the worshipers on earth worshiping in heaven. Now, uh, now it seems that earth can be seen, because John sees an earthquake. Now here's, here's the events, we're going to look at the events that just occurred in this text. After, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter, I'm going back, rightly dividing the word, Peter in Acts chapter 2, quotes the prophet Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, okay? So Joel prophesied this, Peter says it to the crowd, and here it is, Acts chapter 2. In the last days, Peter says to the crowd, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your younger men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. So we see the similar uh, symbolism. So we know that what Joel was talking about and Peter quoted is referring to this sixth seal. Can I just note one thing in this text, though? Before this seal is opened, what is the first promise of end times? In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's the first sign of end times. You being filled with the Holy Spirit. So are you pursuing... What are the end time events? Or are you just saying, Lord, fill me up? That's the first sign. And then all this prophecy through dreams and visions, it's going to be an exciting time for believers. So specific references uh, in this in this text, in what, what Peter said, quoting Joel, in the last days. So he's talking about end times. Verse, verse 20 of Acts chapter 2 says, the glorious day of the Lord, which is the second coming. Peter actually it's either a Hebrew, which is New Testament, and Greek, which is Old Testament, the original uh, writer, writing. The, the, it might be just a translation, but Peter says the glorious day of the Lord. Joel, the, orig- the prophet, said the dreadful day of the Lord. And so the Greek means glorious, which uh, again would be the New Testament, excuse me, Greek, uh, Greek was the New Testament. And that's in the book of Acts, glorious, which means conspicuous, that is memorable. And then Joel's, who wrote in Hebrew, again, I, uh, I uh, apologize for that, that it says dreadful, or to fear, to frighten, or dread, which means to fear to death. Further events here that are similar in Joel's prophecy to our text tonight is the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair and then the whole moon turned blood red so these are the signs of the second coming jesus also mentions this in matthew 24 which we'll look at next week so we know that we're looking at the same the same event sixth seal what peter said quoting joel acts uh, peter also quoting joel says wonders in the heavens and on the earth so What happens in this sixth seal on the earth? Well, we've we've noted in the Bible that when God shows up in power, the earth reacts by shaking. It's called an earthquake. God meets Moses on Mount Sinai with an earthquake. Believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. There's an earthquake. Jesus' resurrection, there's an earthquake. The second coming, no surprise, there'll be an earthquake. Revelation 6 15, the mountains and islands removed. <laughs> I love this part. Uh, this, is, this is my surmise, but I, th- I, think, I think it's true. But I have to say, this is only my guess. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to, 2 to 4 says this. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established on the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. 
Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords with plowshares, uh, into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In other words, all the warriors will turn into farmers. No more war. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So this is referring, when you hear of Zion and the Lord establishing his rule on the earth, this is referring to the millennial reign. We'll see that the further we go into Revelation, in particular chapter 19. The millennial reign happens right after the tribulation. I already did in my earlier teaching uh, the linear at the end of Revelation 19, 20, 21, 22. Those are linear chapters telling the story because each one says, then this happened, then this happened. So we know through those chapters, the millennial reign is right after the tribulation and is ushered in by the second coming of Jesus. So chaos ensues. All the men... <laughs> They, they wage war against God. They complain against God. That's Armageddon. Jesus comes in and wipes out every unbeliever. And then God sets up his throne on Mount Zion. Now, if he set his, his throne up on Mount Zion above every other mountain that exists today, no one would go to talk to him. <laughs> it, it's like mountain climbing to go. And so what, what he does here is he's leveling the earth to establish Mount Zion as the highest point and to make it attainable for people to go to him. So in the sixth seal, we see the leveling of mountains and islands to be, to be set up again to set the stage for Mount Zion. Got it. Um, where do I... Okay, so... Okay, I'll mention it later. I'm get, my brain's getting ahead of my notes. So in the heavens, what is going on? So again, the, the uh, prophet Joel says, wonders in heavens and on earth. So what's happening in the heavens? The stars are falling to the earth. The universe seems to disappear, receding like a scroll being rolled up. And isn't it, it, isn't it interesting that the scroll of this story gets rolled up while the scroll is being, is, all the seals are being popped? I just think that's a neat, uh, neat twist and irony of the Lord. So all that is left on the, is the earth and a red moon, okay? Because note the sun, which darkens, the sun's a star, right? So those are gone, including the sun, which turns black, black as goat hair. So perhaps the new light source is similar to the new Jerusalem. Revelation uh, chapter 21 says this, the city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it for the gl glory of God gives it, it light and the Lamb is its lamp. Isaiah speaks of the glory of Zion, which would talk about this millennial reign, Mount Zion. He says this, Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So it's talking about the millennial reign. So darkness on the planet post-tribulation during the millennial reign will be everywhere that God is not. You got this round planet, and God's going to establish Mount Zion, and that's where the light will be, right there. <laughs> the uh, this is a prophetic fulfillment that Isaiah spoke of in his 34th chapter. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. Same as our text in, in Revelation three or 6. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Isn't that interesting? Reve Revelation 6 has this funny little line that says, like figs that drop from a fig tree. And now Isaiah talks about the fig tree too. Everything in Revelation is deliberate. Here's my little take on it. So I did a study of, of figs. First of all, horticultural one. Figs, trees drop their figs only when they're unhealthy. Uh, so a lack of water, which could mean, you know, 
that it's an analogy of these figs were not connected to God, which is the living water. A lack of pollination from wasps, bees, etc. Young figs drop because they will not produce seeds. Okay, they're not pollinated. This would also be the connection with God, the giver of life. Uh, disease, so they'll drop if they're diseased. Uh, fig mosaic, leaf spot, pink limb blight from lack of water, nutrients from the roots. Pollution of the world caused by neglect of spiritual health. So then there's the weather. The rapid temperature changes. Jesus wants us hot, not cold or lukewarm, right? That was in his letters, or fluctuating. One foot in the world, one foot in the Lord. So now let's look at the biblical references to figs. So the figs dropping we see horticulturally is because they're unhealthy. Now let's look at biblical references to figs. Fig leaves were used to cover Adam and Eve, their nakedness, the result of sin. Fig cakes were often, were used often to revive famished people, so a source of, of nutrition. Isaiah healed Hezekiah with fig ointment. When a city is prosperous and healthy, fig trees are mentioned. When an army threatens a city, they threaten to destroy their fig trees, so, so the figs are valuable. Skeptical Nathaniel was under the fig tree, almost like the drop. Seeking Zacchaeus was in the fig tree. Jesus used the fig tree as an example. Listen to this, Luke 13. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years, that speaks to me, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it, use, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. Since figs are mentioned in the seal number six and in Isaiah's prophecy of the same event, the falling from the fig tree may, signif may signify the last moment people can repent before the second coming and the end of the age of the church. For three years, no fruit, just leave it one more year. Last half of the tribulation is three and a half years, ending with the second coming. Here's something else, though. On another occasion, when Jesus walked the planet, he curses a fig tree. Matthew chapter 21, early in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it'll be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So on the occasion of the fig tree withering, because it had no fruit, because the figs had dropped, Jesus mentions the mountains. In the sixth chapter, we have the mountains being removed and this analogy of figs dropping. Could it be that Jesus wanted us to, to go back to this analogy, figs and mountains, in chapter 6, figs and mountains. And since we've never heard of a mountain being thrown into the sea, and we are the ones riding behind Jesus in the second coming on our white horses, doing his bidding, and we know mountains are being thrown into the sea at that point, since we've never heard of a mountain being thrown into the sea, yet Jesus said it was very easy, if you had faith, and do not doubt. Would, could it be that Jesus was referring to this event in chapter 6, his second coming? By matching the mountain with the fig, which matches seal number 6, this may be prophesying our part in the second coming, riding behind Jesus, telling mountains to go into the sea. <laughs> yeah, Revelation, I believe, whether I'm right or wrong, I believe Revelation reveals the rest of the Bible and reveals a lot of what Jesus was talking about. So I think that's pretty cool. So now let's look at the people. These crazy people. Verse 15. 
the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free. So there's kind of two groups there. There's the, the first list is, are all the ones that looked like they were in control. <laughs> the, the kings, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, they're in control, of course. No, they're not. And then the end of the list is everyone else, both slave and free. No one is outside or above the Almighty. Everyone. Whether they feel like they're in control or whether they feel like they're the victim, everyone is subject to the Almighty. Verse 16 says, They called the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide. This is in contrast. A lot of this is in contrast to God's original design. Listen, uh, and, and, uh, and the way believers experience God. Psalm 27 says, For in the day of, of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me upon a high rock. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where will, where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And, of course, this cry for the mountains to fall and hide on us will not be answered since all the mountains are thrown into the sea anyway. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, but it does say the, the mountains and, and the, the rocks, right? The rocks of the mountains. So, there, there's just rubble left. They continue, these crazy people, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of God. And again, that's in contrast Believers long to see the face of God. The history of God and man, Genesis 3. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden because of sin. Here we are at the end of the story, same thing. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. But then Exodus chapter 33, Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I, have, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you can't see my face for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. Stand on the rock. Again, look at all this irony of what they're at, what these crazy people in Revelation 6 are asking for. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a, in, the, in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back, but my face must not be seen. But then Hebrews 4, New Testament, thanks to the blood of Jesus that covers our sin. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the, the Son of God, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Yet the one who's still lost in their sin, who sees the cross as foolishness, whose minds have been darkened, who have been handed over to a depraved mind, Romans chapter 1 says, Revelation 6, Fallen us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of God. They want to be hid from the very one who's, who loves them and wants them to be saved, who wants to have relationship with them, who wants them to see his face. But the... the just people are stubborn. In conclusion, I want to read a fairly lengthy text to end this teaching that celebrates our hope in the Lamb of God. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Listen to this. The old way, so the Old Testament, with laws etched in stone, led to death, though began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? In the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious. How much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious... How much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Since the new way, and it's talking about Jesus, post Jesus' death and resurrection, and us, the new way, us being covered by his blood. The new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. 
We're not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel could not, would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade from his face. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they can't understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Jesus. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writing, their hearts are covered with that veil and they don't understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. I will not be calling for the mountains to fall on me, to hide me from the face of God. I will, I will run to Him when I see Him, and I know that's you as well. So we receive the blessing tonight. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written, because the time is near.